right, welcome to spring. It is spring. It is. It's our first spring class. Yes. Spring 2019. Crazy. Time is flying. Delicious meals. Amazing meals. And this is certainly going to be one of them. I think that more people have been excited about this meal than they have for almost any other meal. Well, which is kind of funny because it's meatloaf, right? But <laughs> you would think, well, that's something people have been making forever. Their their moms have made it. June Cleaver made it, right? Right. But we're doing a meatloaf with a difference. My mom has made it. Yeah, exactly. But this is all about just taking the the best of flavor and putting it into the comfort foods that we know and love. So yeah, a meatloaf, but a porcini pepper meatloaf, and even more, a speedy porcini pepper meatloaf. Um, cauliflower, I mean, it's kind of the golden child of all vegetables right now, but we're gonna do a cheesy cauliflower to really bring it up to a whole new level, and adobo green beans. And even these might just seem to you like, oh my gosh, this is like comfort food. This is a blue plate special, right? But a blue plate special that you would find in a little bit of an upscale restaurant. Why? Because the flavor is there. Yeah. The flavor comes to us from PS Flavor, and we're so glad that you've joined us in our PS Flavor Club. Yeah. And really excited. It's funny that we said happy spring, right? Because Minnesota, for those of you that are watching us from there, are not feeling it right now. I know, even a, a few from New York yes. are saying not, not spring, Pam. And this is Pam Smith. She is our chef. <laughs> every month for our cooking classes and I'm Nicole Talbot, I'm Pam's daughter um, and probably one of her biggest fans so I love getting to do this with her but we love having you here with us so um, get ready for a great meal if you're just watching like a culinary demo welcome enjoy we have Tashandra um, who is Spice Girl to Tashandra she is going to be moderating which means if you have any questions while you're cooking this is live live TV happening right here. So if you have any questions while you're cooking or watching, just type them out. Tashandra will read them and you'll get an answer right yeah. away um, while we are cooking. Yeah, it's gonna be fantastic. We should, we're, we're, we should do that. We should toast and we, we need should to cook. toast and then we should cook because you will find if you were able to download our recipe and take a look at it, maybe did a little bit of the mise en place, everything in place, you found that one of the things that was on that was Pam's pairing, Pam's pick. And in this case, we um, had the choice for a beautiful Zinfandel and Merlot, both of those wines that would just be beautiful with the meatloaf. But because we're also doing that cheesy cauliflower, we felt like we would do a little sparkling rosé, which is another idea. Um, this is a Graham Beck sparkling rosé, and so with that, cheers. Rosé all day. Rosé all day, <laughs> indeed. At least starting right now. You no, know, yes. and if you need that document with the recipe, Pam's pairing, your grocery list, your prep sheet, it's all in the Cooking Club Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash PS Flavor Cooking Club. You can grab your file and uh, follow along. Absolutely, it's really super fun. If you've not um, yet turned your oven on, we have ours on. We've had it on for a while. Ovens and the and the kitchen's getting a little yeah. warm because of that. Um, but we have it set at 400, and in the oven we have a pan that's kind of awaiting our cauliflower to yet to come. Um, we already had it turned on 400 because we cooked our mushrooms, and that's one of the kind of options in the, in the recipe for this incredible porcini pepper meatloaf is that you have an option to either just use fresh mushrooms, baby bellas, which are um, cremini mushrooms or white buttons, whichever you would choose, you can use them raw or we always take that extra step and we actually have them roasted, yeah. so we'll talk about that. And I'm gonna grab the camera so we can get closer up, see what you're doing, hit every step and uh, Enjoy. Enjoy, yes, again, toast cheers. To you. Yes, toast and to toast you. to you. We'll see and you. And off we go, I know, fantastic. Oh. So I talked about having the mushrooms already cooked. We've done that, and I'll show you in just a minute what we do with those mushrooms, because we use them to do something called the blend. And I talk about it a lot. I do burgers with it, I do chili with it, I do um, vegetarian chilies with it, because the mushrooms give this incredible Incredible meaty umami kind of flavor and what it's gonna do for this porcini meatloaf is 
over the top delicious because we already are going to have the porcini pepper, which we'll talk about in a moment. That's our beautiful spice blend for the season, but we're also gonna have that layer of the mushrooms, which again, give moisture. Everything that you might not like about a meatloaf, maybe a little gummy, maybe a little bland, that's not gonna happen. We're gonna have all the flavor, all the moisture, all the deliciousness you could ever ask for. One of the things that's gonna help us with that is we're making a really delicious chipotle tomato glaze. Now, if you grew up on meatloaf, I did. Um, my mom would make a big old meatloaf. <clears throat> I have six brothers, so she would make this big old meatloaf, cover it with ketchup. She put ketchup in it, cover it with ketchup, bake it, and the ketchup kind of became a glaze. Well, I'm not wanting to just do a ketchup, but I'm wanting to do that same kind of caramelized glaze. So we're gonna do one with a difference, and it's, it's a really nice and speedy one. Um, this whole meal is all about trying to be a little bit speedy. Um, what we're gonna be doing is basically cooking down tomatoes. Um, in this case, we're just using canned tomatoes, um, a beautiful fire-roasted petite diced tomato. If you, can't find fire roasted, no problem, because we're gonna be using some chipotle peppers. That's gonna give you a little bit of that fire in and of itself. I'm gonna get a pan, just starting to heat just a little bit, add just a little touch of olive oil to it, and then add some onions and get those onions starting to cook, not really trying to do a whole lot with them because this whole sauce is gonna cook for us and it's gonna cook pretty quickly. I'm expecting it to cook for us in about 10 minutes, important, because again, we're gonna be wanting to use it in this really delicious meatloaf application. Um, Nicole, should we tell them about how we kind of went from point to point to point with this meatloaf? Um, interesting, we wanted to do a meatloaf but we also want to show you how to do a whole meal from start to finish in the 45 minutes to an hour that we have in our in our time together here on facebook live so a meatloaf wouldn't do that in that period of time it needs to bake more for an hour and 15 minutes and then uncover it put the glaze on another 15. so we decided we were going to do little individual meatloaves but even those took a little bit of time and so then we decided it was time to do a little muffin meatloaf. So in just a moment, you'll see how we pop them into a muffin tin and it enables us to cook those in rather than an hour and a half, this is where the speedy comes in, to instead cook those in, in just about 20, 22 minutes, which is exactly what we need to do when we're focused on meal in a hurry. The thing that's been incredible though, is we have seen that people have just come to love the idea of having these little individual meatloaves. If you have kids that might not be too crazy about a tomato glaze, no problem, leave it separate. I think Tashandra is doing that with her daughter. Um, it gives you that opportunity to really almost customize and individualize, and even better still, an opportunity to pop those into the freezer so when you need a truly speedy meal in a hurry, you can just pull those out, zap them in the microwave, and voila, you've got a great meal. I have the onions cooking. I'm gonna add just some garlic that, because I'm gonna be pureeing this, no need to go through the struggle or the trouble to even mince this garlic. All that I've done is just taken the garlic cloves and truly with a really beautiful knife that comes to us straight from a Cutco, which we'll talk about in a bit, I just smash it um, using the back of my hand and the knife just to be able to release those essential oils from the garlic, but no need to go through the trouble of actually dicing it. Throw that into the pan, allow that to start to release those oils. And it's not the same with the onion. It really, you needed to chop it up and it really just needed to be a rough chop. A rough chop, yeah. Okay. No need to kind of take it through that fine dice, just not really important at all. Um, to this, we're going to, before we take it too far though, add our chili lime. Chili lime is what's making this our amazing, um, not just a chipotle tomato glaze, but is making it a really, really beautiful, developed kind of flavor. I like to get that in and allow some of those essential oils to start to release. Then I'm going to add um, our chipotle peppers. Um, again, in the recipe, if you've not used chipotle peppers, 
they're just straight <laughs> as I get choked on that beautiful spice that's come in. They're straight from a can. Um, the recipe calls for one to two chipotle peppers. I'm just using one. We made this um, just a couple of weeks ago and decided that there were some in the house that might not want all of that kind of spice. When she says some, it. she very much means me, Nicole. Yes. Because I am one of those. That I love one. the flavor, but I don't love really spicy. No. So going with one pepper really did the job. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it getting, kept you coughing. It's kept me coughing, exactly. Um, but even the pepper itself, I cut it in half. I took the seeds out of it, which is where um, a lot of the heat comes in. Um, I'm going to deglaze the pan with the apple cider vinegar. Deglazing is simply adding a liquid to a pan that's got some what's called fond at the bottom. You might consider it some little burned bits of onion and maybe even that beautiful chili lime. But by adding the, the vinegar to it, we're kind of pulling all of that up. You see that rather than the brown bits, now it's been able to lift it right up into the sauce. And that's kind of where the flavor magic comes in. Once I have that going, I'm gonna add my tomatoes to it. This is a large can of, again, a petite diced tomato. Fine to use fresh tomatoes. Um, in just a few months, we're gonna be having an abundance coming from the garden, and this would be a perfect place to use them. But never fear, tomatoes are one of the few things that I feel really good about um, getting from the can because if they're a quality tomato, and you can get a San Marzano, or as we talked about, a fire roasted tomato, you get um, just a lot of concentrated flavor in it. They pick those tomatoes at their peak of harvest, so you're not getting green tomatoes that have later been gassed to make them ripe. Instead, they're at their peak of harvest. Um, they go into the, the um, dish and just give you a lot of beautiful sweetness and acidity, which is exactly what we're getting with this dish. Now, in the recipe, you called for three to four tablespoons mm -hmm. of chili lime, and I saw you, you mm -hmm. know, measuring that out and putting really it carefully in. Really carefully measuring. Really carefully measuring. Yes. How, how do you decide? Is it just a flavor preference of how sweet and chili you like it, or what was your deciding factor? Well, because every single thing that we do in a recipe is always unique to the ingredients. You think, well you're using the same ingredients so shouldn't it be the same all the time well no it's not again if you left a few of those seeds in the chipotle pepper it's a little more spicy so you might need a little bit of the balance that comes from the chili lime a little bit of the sweetness that comes from the sugar um, in the raw a little bit of the deep warm spices to balance that out um, we used a vidalia onion which is already sweet but if you used a red onion or one that wasn't as sweet, again, you might want to use that. It's always a beautiful balance of trying to balance a little bit of acidity, that's where the apple cider vinegar, or the tomatoes come in, um, a little bit of sweetness, that's where we're getting from the, the both the chili lime, but also that sweet Valdea onion, and a little bit of heat. And that's where we get the, not only chipotle pepper, but the adobo that's with that. Tashandra, do we have a question? We do. Okay, so any suggestions if we don't have access to a blender? Ah, to be able to do this. Well, we're going to um, use an immersion blender for this particular dish um, because I can do it very quickly right into it. And if you've not ever seen an immersion blender, they're inexpensive, they're easy to store. And they're amazing because rather than having to transfer this very hot liquid into a blender, we're gonna use the immersion blender to be able to make it into a smooth kind of texture. A food processor would work just as well. A stand-up blender would work just as well. Or you just really wanna go rustic. Go rustic, hello, there goes our spoons. Um, go rustic because um, this is going to be just a really beautiful glaze that you could also just use as a chunky kind of tomato sauce. That's great. So it's really, really what we're making is the ketchup. 
for the exactly. meatloaf. Yeah. So even if you go a little chunky, it's mm -hmm. just a delicious tomato mm -hmm. glaze for your meatloaf. Yeah, actually when we made this a couple of weeks ago, um, I used what we had left over to add to a tomato sauce and used oh. it as a pasta sauce. So wow. the versatility goes on and on. So we're gonna let that just cook down mm. and I'm gonna get started on um, what else we need to do, which is making the meatloaf itself. Um, I have already for us roasted the mushrooms and to roast mushrooms, all we did was take about a pound, 16 ounces of mushrooms and put them into a bowl, toss them with just a little bit of olive oil and some porcini pepper. Porcini pepper is kind of our star of this particular meal show. Porcini pepper is a beautiful blend of um, porcini, dried porcini powder um, that's been fresh ground together with some smoky, um, smoked paprika, a um, little bit of lemon, a little bit of a Creole kind of taste. It's just absolutely delicious. Notably one of our favorite because it's almost like natural MSG. It's this craveable kind of spice that with anything that you mix it with, you've just got all the flavor going on. We toss that with this. You could also just use some kosher salt and a little bit of pepper if you wanted to, or if you're a fan of our PS Flavor Creole Kitchen, that's oftentimes what I roast mushrooms with. Get them into a very hot oven. As I mentioned, we have it set at 400. Toss it in that little bit of olive oil, a um, little bit of the seasoning, and then put it onto the hot pan right into the oven and allow it to roast until those mushrooms pretty much dry out. Um, you're not looking for a lot of moisture with them. If you look at the pan um, that I took, that was ready to go. You should give all the best kitchen hacks all while you do that. Best. Now, I did want to pause and uh -huh. say, if you did not get a chance to roast your mushrooms uh -huh. ahead of time, I know you said we could do fresh. And basically, they would just be putting them in the right. food processor just like you are, but they need to make sure to put their two teaspoons of porcini pepper with them because right. we seasoned when we roasted. Right, exactly. But, or just add additional porcini pepper to the meatloaf oh, itself. Oh, okay, great. Um, and we call for eight ounces of roasted mushrooms, which start as 16 ounces. The roasting takes a lot of the moisture out, so they reduce by about half. If you're using them raw, just use eight ounces, which is really one package of your baby bellas or your button mushrooms, and any of them work. So gonna be loud for just one minute again, but what I'm trying to do is get this down to about the grind of hamburger meat. Um, it's why I use it in burgers, because you don't know it's there. But what you're doing is you're doing this incredible blend. Almost all of my blends are a blend of about 75% um, ground whatever the meat might be it might be ground beef it might be ground turkey I know a lot of you are vegan or vegetarian and you're using a meat replacement like a Beyond Burger or maybe some of you are even using Impossible Burger if you were able to get some of that again whatever um, protein quote quote that you're using by putting those mushrooms in you're just getting this incredible flavor boost and I'm Quite excited by it but the goal is again to get it to about the grind size of whatever you're using the ground turkey the ground chicken the ground beef the ground beyond beef so loud <laughs> just pull this down. You can make a lot of this at one time. I do. Um, it. You can make it. It freezes. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I've been known to roast 20 pounds of mushrooms at one time. So I always have that blend opportunity available to me. Okay, so you just stirred it around a little mm -hmm, and then right? keep going. <laughs> Someone's going to make a very quiet food processor. So you can see it's just a very fine grind, and that's the grind that we're going to turn around and put together with our beef. Again, we have 
a pound and a half of a very lean brown sirloin. We're gonna mix that together with this half pound of the mushrooms. And with that, we get that exact 25% mushrooms and 75% ground beef. And let's go take a look at it and so we can see what this, okay, so about the size of ground beef. Mm -hmm. And I love that because then people that don't like mushrooms, you don't even know it's there. You have no idea. And it's, it's phenomenal. I, I will tell you, at school systems all across America, children every single day are having a blended burger. They don't know it because it's just a burger. And that's what they're buying when they go into their school system. But what they're getting is a, is a better burger. They're getting something that has, again, not only the vitamin D and the immune boosting powers of mushrooms, but they're getting less meat. And with that, so much more flavor in addition. So it's a perfect kind of blend. And once you get it blended into that round, I'm gonna just get it right into your meat. As I mentioned, I've got a, a pound and a half of a, and this particular meat is a grass-fed um, beef. I'm quite in love with um, Australian beef and lamb. And one of the reasons I am is because not only is it grass-fed, but it's raised with just a lot of love and care, um, without antibiotics, um, beautiful land that it's raised on, and um, really makes me feel really good about using it. And it's delicious, and that is what makes the essential difference. It always comes back to the flavor. Then give a little stir to our glaze. You can see it's cooking right down and starting to release a lot of the moisture that's in it. That reduction is what's bringing all of that flavor together. Um, with this blend that we already have in play, I've added the mushrooms. Also going to add a cup of a Japanese breadcrumb. If you've not used panko before, you might have recipes that call for breadcrumbs. I um, always encourage you to go for panko. It is a dry breadcrumb. It just has such texture to it and just works beautifully with whatever you might be blending it with. I use it oftentimes for a crumb topping delicious in a meatloaf. So if a recipe just says breadcrumbs, it's mm -hmm. absolutely okay just to use panko? Just use panko. Fantastic. Yes, and you can find it now anywhere. Back in the day, it was a little exotic, not so much now. In addition to that, we're adding um, some onion, about a half of a Vidalia onion, which is about three quarters of a cup, and about a half a cup of a diced red pepper. And I'd love to see how small you diced those. Okay. So a small dice. A small dice, and that's important because in this particular case, you're not wanting to bite into, remember these are little speedy meatloafs, so you're not wanting to bite into a big old hunk of onion or red pepper. So a nice fine dice on those. Um, we're gonna add a little bit of binding to this, and that's two eggs, as the recipe calls from. Two egg or four, two eggs that you just do a light beat. We have a couple of people that are making this meal again with a um, Beyond Beef, which is a Beyond Burger, which is a um, vegetarian, vegan kind of replacement. And they asked what could they use in place of egg. And we talked about probably one of my favorite little things of the moment and most chef's favorite things of the moment. It's called aquafaba. It's the liquid in chickpeas, um, cooked chickpeas, just a can of a lower sodium chickpea. Um, the, the liquid can whip up almost like whipped cream. You can make a meringue with it. It has an incredible kind of protein simulation that's very similar to an egg and the same kind of binding characteristics. So if I was making a burger that had no animal protein in it, instead of using the egg, I would use about three tablespoons of the aquafaba. So I wanted to show you that. It's just again, when you are using chickpeas, even if you're using them from a can, just take the chickpeas off, drain it in a separate bowl, not just down the disposal, and save that aquafaba. It's really special. Also adding just a little touch of Worcestershire sauce. The Worcestershire sauce gives, again, even more of a boost of umami. 
and we're adding some porcini pepper. We already have, again, some porcini pepper that we have in the dish because of the mushrooms, but we're gonna add just a little bit more to this because that's gonna be kind of our secret ingredient that's gonna make the difference with this, this speedy meatloaf. And that's about one tablespoon mm -hmm. that you used there. Yeah, exactly, and about a quarter cup of cilantro. Oh my gosh, it's so bright and beautiful. Isn't it? I mean, and really, it's interesting because this blend that I'm using for a meatloaf, without the breadcrumbs and egg, this would be a blend you could use for chili. It'd be a blend you could use for Taco Tuesday. You could use it in so many ways for so many things. The breadcrumbs and the egg just add that little bit of binding capability. Now, how about if we were using it as a burger patty? Would we still use the egg to bind it for the burger patty or just Not the necessary mixture? because mm -hmm. the mushrooms itself will hold um, all of the moisture in that you need. Um, the, the key is all about how much of the percentage blend you're doing with the mushrooms. If you're cooking on a grill, I always suggest a burger have no more than about 25% of um, the the substance coming from the mushrooms, about 75% of the beef. If you're cooking it in a cast iron skillet or on um, what would be called in a restaurant a flat top, you've got the capability to do a little bit of a different blend, even go up as much as 40% of the ground mushrooms and 60% of whatever beef you might be using. So we're just getting this really nicely mixed up. Um, you had mentioned, could we use it as burgers? Another thing that would be beautiful, the exact same recipe, is to use it as meatballs. Oh. And just forming these into small little meatballs that you could start maybe by searing in a cast iron skillet on top of the stove, finish them off in the oven, or just put them right onto a sheet pan and get them into a very hot oven works really beautifully. And there we go. We've got our blend. We sure do. It looks amazing. and. I have tasted it. Spoiler yes, alert, I've yes. tasted these uh, mini meatloafs we're doing and it really is as great as it looks. Well, and again, back to being skinny, it gives us the opportunity to do exactly what we're seeking to do and that's get something going and get it going really quickly. Um, I have taken just a traditional muffin tin. Now again, if I had all the time in the world, I would just, instead of doing this, I would put it into maybe a loaf pan or, honestly, I kind of like doing a free form on a sheet pan more than shaping it into a meatloaf. I'm not into a loaf pan. I'm not sure if it, that's just my, again, trying to recover from leave it to beaver days, but I just like that, that kind of free form that you can do on a sheet pan in and of itself, make it whatever size, whatever shape you want. And in this case, it's kind of auto program because we're gonna use just as much as what would come into this. If you happen to have a handy little scooper, like an ice cream scoop, it's one of the easiest ways to be able to do this because you literally can scoop out the amount that you need. In this case, I'm going to just make my own little, almost a tennis ball kind of a shape just enough to fit right in to the, again, muffin tins where the um, wells, as they are called, have been sprayed with just a little bit of nonstick spray. Okay, so you just used some Pam or some sort of cooking spray. Mm -hmm. Now, you usually use an olive oil one. Is that what you use here? I, it okay. is, it is, yeah. And, you know, I'm a big Costco fan, so I tend to just use theirs as compared to the traditional name brand. So again, just think tennis ball in this case. Um, I have made these even in smaller amounts, almost for an appetizer. Um, these are beautiful, as I mentioned, to make as a, as a meatball. You could do them as a little meatball slider and would work out really amazing. So really whatever size works is whatever size you wanna do. Forming, forming. You can see that a little scoop would work out really nicely. Or if you're trying to figure out how your kids can get involved, which I'm always trying to think when I'm cooking with my nine-year-old, mm -hmm. um, you know, good hand washing and then helping to form these is a right. really nice way to get get the kids involved. And uh, every time she helps out, she feels a lot of pride about our meal. Well, and it's really one of the best ways to get. 
um, kids trying things that they might not normally try. What they make, they're much more apt to try back and Nicole would not tell you this probably, but back in the day, um, I had written a book called Come Cook With Me, which is a cookbook for kids. And um, again, that was the whole premise of it. It was how do you get your kids to really try and be a little more experimental with food. And um, we did just some really, really fun things. And meatloaf was one of them. <coughs> Tashandra, Spice Girls, Tashandra, we've got a question. Yes, we do from one of our viewers. So, um, they said, I have something called a cilantro instead of cilantro. Um, will that give the same flavor? So, cilantro, which is spelled C-U-L-A-N-T-R-O, is actually a little different than cilantro. Okay. It's a leaf um, that's very big in Puerto Rican cooking and Spanish cooking. Um, you can find it at most um, grocery stores, but a little bit different. Um, it has a little more earthy kind of a taste, a little more peppery than a classic cilantro. Um, generally, I tell people if you're not going to use cilantro, a little bit of a great substitute is to use flat leaf parsley instead. But again, no fear using the cilantro. It's just gonna take on a little bit of a sofrito taste. If you're <laughs> familiar with Puerto Rican cooking, um, sofrito is a very big part of um, almost anything that they use, the way we would use pico de gallo or salsa, um, sofrito is just a very big part of it, and cilantro is a big part of that. But if so, that's what they have right now, use go it. ahead and use it. Yes, just recognize it's not cilantro. Okay, that's great. Um, so I you, actually just thought it was a typo at the grocery store, so that's great to really? know. Well, you know, when it came up, there was a question, and I thought maybe it was a joke. I wasn't no. sure. I didn't know. How about that? So the, aren't those really awesome? They're beautiful. I know. <laughs> Absolutely love those. Um, as you can see, while we've been making those, um, our glaze has cooked down so it really is almost like a thick tomato sauce. That's oh, probably the best way to think of it. This would be a time to do just a little bit of a taste. Mmm. Wow, that's good. Nicole knows I always love um, most of the things I cook. Um, and actually, I think it's really perfect for what we're wanting to do, but it's the time to taste. You might want to add just a little bit more of the chili lime. You might want to think well, maybe just a little touch of kosher salt. Again, anything that you want to do to try to balance those flavors, but I'm really loving that right now. So we're going to let that stand just as it is. And we're going to use our immersion blender to be able to make the magic happen. Yes, indeed. I'm not you, sure. You I thought I was going to help you, but I didn't end up helping. Yeah. I'm Instead, we'll show this beautiful glaze <laughs> that's coming. I know. I got a little concerned that that friend back sparkling rosé was going to go tumbling down. So, again, these are so handy. Um, again, you do want to step back just a little bit. Maybe not the best thing to be wearing, though a white um, jacket with when you're doing it, but literally just put the immersion blender right into that hot liquid. Again, if you were having to put this into a blender, um, one of the things you hear all of the time is that you want to be very careful with things that you put into a hot blender. People will oftentimes blend soups and the steam that builds up when you start blending a hot liquid can pop the top off of a stand blender. And there's many people that have tomato sauce all over <laughs> their roof of their, or the ceiling of their kitchen. Um, we've had some pretty interesting experiences through the years with what stand blenders can do. They're a force to be reckoned with. Again, I'm not looking to make this a really smooth puree. If I wanted to make it into a smooth one, what I would do is do a blending just like this and then put it through a food mill or a fine mesh um, kind of a seed to be able to press out some of those tomato solids. But again, I'm wanting this to be relatively rustic. This is a blue plate special. So we really want to make it just all about the flavor and really not much more than that. And we're in great shape. And Nicole somehow managed 
to save the champagne, and we're really excited about that. He did. The, the, the champagne glass wanted to go, but... It did want to go, right? Thankfully, right hand with the camera, left hand with the champagne glass. Exactly. So I have these already set. Um, so all I'm going to do is just take a little bit of the sauce and put them right on top. I'm gonna to come back and do this again a little bit later, but it's just my starting glaze. They look beautiful already, right? Oh, they look gorgeous. Now, if you were feeding kids and you weren't sure if they were gonna love the glaze, would you just leave it off? I would. I would just leave it completely off and then serve it to the side. Okay. Um, they'll cook beautifully. I would rub just a little touch of olive oil right on top so that you get a little bit still of a, caramelization that happens with the meat on top but other than that you're fine and really it's interesting um, you know we're always thinking about what what should we be using um, again you could if you were doing a this is a turkey kind of a meatloaf you could do a little apricot jam glaze and put on top of it maybe with a little soy sauce and mustard um, again go go beyond just thinking red or be, go beyond thinking just tomatoes um, doing a berry um, when summer is in and fresh berries are everywhere you could do a kind of a berry um, chipotle sauce almost the same thing we did here but instead of using tomatoes you could use blackberries a blackberry chipotle glaze which would be fantastic and here we go wow ready to pop these right into the oven and in the oven, I already have a pan that's waiting for our cauliflower. So I'm gonna get those in first. I mean, I'm, I'm loving those, right? Absolutely. Now, I know later in the recipe, we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the placement of where the cauliflower is going. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that you put the meatloaf right in the middle. Right. Because we're trying to cook a few things at a time. We are. At one time, rather. And to take advantage of the fact that we have the oven on, so let's use the heat in the smartest way possible but I also want to, in quick order, get working on our cauliflower because we want to get that into the oven and get it roasting as well. Okay, great. I have the cauliflower already cut into florets, and if you looked at the recipe, you see that it called for a head of cauliflower, but cutting it into small, you know, little florets. And you want to have them relatively small so that, again, they'll cook evenly. I wanted to show you how easy it is to do if you're just wanting to actually cut um, your own cauliflower. And I know a lot of you bought cauliflower florets already done. But just cut out that essential core. And what you do is you just have the florets that kind of make their, their own self. Oh, wow. Very easy to do. Well, um, I love seeing that gourmet prep knife yes. in action because that is what one of our very lucky PS Flavor Cooking Club members is going to have the opportunity to win this month. And all that they have to do is post a picture of their speedy porcini pepper meatloaf meal with a picture of a jar or bag of their PS Flavor seasoning. Wow. So one picture, post it, entry, and maybe get a gourmet prep knife. It's gorgeous. It has a little cauliflower florets on it right now, I, but it's- As it's, it should. As, as it, it should. should. Well, they're white. The, it's a beautiful pearl handle. It's perfect. So um, with this, I do pretty much what I do with, with any time I'm roasting, and that is I add just a little touch of olive oil. Um, I'm gonna use the porcini pepper in this again and add that to the cauliflower and just gently toss that. Again, you could certainly use Creole, you could use a little salt and pepper. I'm just so crazy about the umami craveability that comes with getting that porcini pepper onto the cauliflower and I love what it does with um, almost starting a little bit of the browning that goes on with it as well. And Once that's, that's done. Oh, I was just going to say, that's about a tablespoon and uh -huh. a half of porcini pepper. If they were using Creole, they'd probably use a little less. A lot right? less, a yeah, lot because less. Creole um, is more of a, of a salt and pepper replacement. So if you were using Creole, you would probably use a teaspoon okay. rather than a tablespoon and a half. We've had this pan in the oven since we started the class. So it's been heating and waiting just for its making moment. its moment. And what we're waiting for is just that, to get the cauliflower in, to hear that beautiful searing kind of notion. Mm. Let the magic happen. 
and kind of get it nice and even. One of the mistakes we make with sheet pan cooking or roasting is we tend to kind of um, crowd the pan. All vegetables are loaded with moisture and when you crowd the pan, you end up steaming them as compared to allowing them to roast and caramelize. We're putting them on the bottom because we're really wanting to get that good heat, but we don't want to burn them. Later, I'm going to put them up on the top and you'll see a little bit more action that's going on with that. So in it goes. We have both the um, little speedy porcini meatloaf muffins that are cooking. Um, I mentioned that you could make it into a traditional meatloaf. These are gonna cook in you know, 20 minutes or so. A traditional meatloaf will cook in about an hour and 15. Um, I generally cook at a pretty high heat um, and I start it covered. Then I uncover it for that final 15 minutes, add a little bit more of the glaze to be able to give again a little bit more of the caramelization that goes on with it. But you really um, have to invest a lot more time when it's a meatloaf with a difference. While that is going, um, we should get started with the cheesy part of the cheesy cauliflower because once the cauliflower is actually cooked, we're going to top it with a really delicious um, kind of you know, scrumptious, yunctious kind of sauce um, that's all about the cheese. I grew up um, eating macaroni and cheese. I grew up eating potatoes that were cheesy. And I grew up eating cauliflower, but it was just always so bland. So this is kind of a really nice in-between. Take that same bowl that you used for um, tossing the cauliflower with the porcini pepper, and we're gonna do a little bit of a blending of some yogurt, Greek yogurt, which I certainly did not grow up with. And, and Greek spoon. yogurt really is new of the last, what? Well, not new, but new to us <laughs> in our in our grocery stores. We love the about last, that, right? you know, what seven years. Yeah. But I'm... what makes yogurt Greek? Well, it's interesting because you're right. I mean, Greek yogurt in Italy, the Mediterranean, is just yogurt. Um, when we had yogurt, if you will, imported in, it was too tart for us, we didn't understand it. And so- It was misunderstood, it was yogurt. Mis it was misunderstood. So it ended up becoming this dessert kind of concoction, just loaded with sugar, worse, high fructose corn syrup. The yogurt itself um, was um, not drained. Again, that's the unique difference between what we would consider traditional yogurt, which is not traditional at all, but, um, the Greek yogurt that we know has been drained, the whey has been drained off of it, which is why it's thicker. Um, it has a much higher protein, a much lower carbohydrate level. Um, for years, I, Nicole, growing up with a nutritionist for mom, we used to make our own yogurt and I would drain the yogurt um, in a coffee filter. Again, this is before you could ever buy Greek yogurt. So, Again, it's, it's the thing that has been around for a very long time. It's just not what we could get so commercially. Now we can. I'm asked all the time, what's my favorite? Faya, um, F-A-G-E is my favorite. Um, it's pronounced Faya and really delicious. And that's what we're using. It's a plain yogurt, no sugar added to it. And it really becomes an awesome substitute for everything from mayonnaise to sour cream. In this case, it's gonna become the base for this cheesy sauce. Now, uh, do you have a preference between 0% fat, 2% whole fruit? Because I've seen Greek yogurt um, coming in all of those. Right. And I'm never quite sure. You know, if you're just eating yogurt by itself, um, you know, I think you can let that be your choice, whole, um, 2% non-fat because I use it so oftentimes as a cooking ingredient. I tend to always get the zero fat because I really wanna let the fat that's coming in come from the olive oil or come from the pistachios or the cheeses that I'm using. So it's one place that I can get all of the texture, all of the functionality of the yogurt, but it's an easy place to not have any additional fat. All right, that's great, great question. So I mixed into this um, some 
So not only the yogurt, but I also mixed in a light cream cheese, um, Neufchatel or a light cream cheese. It's not an artificial, it's just a, a cream cheese that's made with a lower fat milk, higher in protein, um, lower in fat, and has yet all of that creaminess of cream cheese. So it's really beautiful. I'm also using some Guerriere cheese, which is a Swiss cheese that has this beautiful nutty alpine kind of a flavor. And that's going um, right in, actually, that's Parmesan. Um, that's going right into this cheesy blend as well. And then I'm gonna be using about two tablespoons of Parmesan cheese. I'm gonna reserve the rest that I'm gonna use on with my breadcrumbs that are gonna become the topping. Looks amazing, doesn't it? Well, so craveable. I just wanted to take a big spoonful of that. Yes, and say, oh, we're happy. Just we're with happy that with our, our cheese and Greek yogurt. Now, interestingly, um, we had a couple people that made this dish last night, and they asked us, is this something I can do in advance? Mm -hmm. um, because they were having some people over, and, and the answer to that is absolutely. You could go ahead and roast the cauliflower just as I'm doing, pull it out, kind of just hold it aside, get this all ready to go, and then when it's ready to serve, get the cauliflower back in the oven just to come back up to a hot temp, then add this and take it to that final stage. Same thing could happen with your little mini meatloaves. You could actually cook them in advance, pull them out, hold them, and then right before you're ready to serve, put them back in the oven, adding a little bit more of that glaze to finish them off. So it could be a meal that you're doing in advance, which is lovely, um, but just those few last minute assembly things that go on with it. And when you say hold it, you mean to wrap it and put it in the refrigerator, take it out, and then we heat it back up in the well, oven? Well, it depends on when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're having, if you're just doing it an hour or so before, no need to put it in the refrigerator. To the contrary, let it sit out, kind of just hold itself. Um, you know, no more than two hours though, because then you're going to be putting it back into the oven and bringing it up to cook temperature. Okay, great. Um, to that remaining Parmesan cheese, I'm adding a little bit more of the panko um, because I'm going to use that as a little bit of a cheese crumb topping that's going to go on top of the cream cheese and yogurt kind of blend. Pretty amazing, right? Oh, it is, and so delicious. Um, we also had some questions about the Guerrier cheese because I think a lot of people have gotten so used to going to the store and buying shredded um, cheddar or shredded mozzarella and shredded Parmesan, but you don't find shredded Guerrier. It's something that you find in a block. So the way that you shred it is just, if you still have one of these old timey box graters, it's one of the easiest ways. You could use the food processor that we use to grind our mushrooms. There's an attachment that lets you shred. Or you can also buy a microplane that is very similar to the one that I use for zesting, but this is for cheeses and cheeses and chocolates actually, and you can just grate it very easily. These are also awesome to do this little cool grating on top of something like your pasta or your flatbread that you might be having. So that's all set to go. All right, so like we it. have our meatloaf in the oven, we, we have do. our cauliflower roasting, we have our cheesy part all mixed mm -hmm. up, and our glaze is still um, happy, happy, good. Yes. So does that mean that it's green bean time? It's green bean time now. So Nicole, you should probably tell the story because this was totally your request of green beans. Well, well, it's here's not what just green beans, but what happened with the green beans? We were going back and forth about green beans or broccoli because so many people love green beans and broccoli when they go out, mm -hmm. but somehow when they make it at home, it just doesn't end up being what they want. But right. I love my mom's green beans and broccoli. So as simple as it seemed, we decided green beans needed to be in this meal, the perfect comfort food meal. It, it is, and it's, it's just done so differently. Those of you that have joined us for you know, our last year and a half or so of, of our cooking classes on Facebook Live know that you know, we pan sear asparagus, we oven roast cauliflower, we're just doing lots of things, sheet pan ratatouilles, we're doing just some very cool things. But sometimes it's just good to go back to the basics. So again, this is the way that I, again, my girls grew up having broccoli, green beans, 
anything that would be cooked on the stove. I grew up with, um, again, a very southern um, upbringing, and my mother, grandmother cooked their green beans to death. Some of you would identify with that. Cooked their spinach, their greens, their collard greens to death. Um, you had to put bacon grease in them to get any flavor. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, what I wanted to do instead was to do something that could be done over the stove, but something that could be done in a much healthier way. Um, I got the pan nice and heated up, probably a little too heated up. I added a little chicken stock to it, and now I'm gonna use adobo. And for our um, plant forward folks, could they use a vegetable stock? Vegetable stock or even just water. Okay. There's so much flavor that's going into this um, from the adobo itself. And mm -hmm. for those of you that don't know about our adobo kitchen, it's it's our turmeric um, dream. It's, it's all based on beautiful turmeric, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, anti-diabetes, anti-everything. It's kind of the golden child and it is a gold color as you see even by my hands as I add that to this. Um, just a beautiful blending. If you've had an adobo that you bought commercially, oftentimes all you're getting from those is salt with a little lacing of, of turmeric. This is turmeric um, with with onion and cumin and garlic and black pepper. It's just loaded with flavor and it becomes the perfect seasoning. No need for bacon, no need for be looking for something else to give flavor to these green beans because you're getting it right here. Um, all I've done is bought green beans. I haven't broken them into little small pieces. I like the whole green beans and I've just either bought them snipped, these were, or you can snip the ends yourself with your trusty super shears. Add these right to that broth, either the vegetable broth, the chicken stock, the water that you might be using. Once you get them added in, all you're wanting to do is then add just a little touch of olive oil right to the top. Now, the, oh, uh, I wanted to just say, I think the thing that um, whenever I've shown people how to cook these green beans, that's so different for people is you're not filling the liquid above mm -mm. the vegetable. No. And we're so used to cooking pasta mm -hmm. and you know boiling water before you do it. But all you've done is put the liquid in, mm -hmm. a small amount really, right. the liquid in, put your beans in, you're not boiling, you're right. putting those in, you've seasoned and they're ready to cook. Yeah, they absolutely are. And they'll cook very quickly. Um, these will cook because they're a little bit larger green bean and anywhere from seven to nine minutes. If you're using a baby green, French green bean, a hair cover, they would cook in three to four minutes. Um, broccoli, same thing, cooks in about five to seven minutes. Only thing different if you're cooking broccoli, and we should probably do that in a future um, time, is broccoli releases a, a particular chemical, a sulfur chemical, that you need to be able to let that release in the steam. So when I'm cooking broccoli, I let the lid off just a little bit so that it steams off at least for about two minutes. Okay. Um, if you've ever cooked broccoli and it turns this horrific olive green rather than that vibrant green, it's because that sulfur compound um, ends up taking the chlorophyll to a really ugly place. But just by doing this with mm -hmm. your lid for two minutes while you're cooking your broccoli, it keeps it nice keeps and green. It. You're good well, to go. Kitchen hack. That kitchen hack 101. I'm gonna turn that down to about a medium high and um, let that just continue to cook, as I said, five to seven minutes or so. Let's get in here and check on our meatloaf. It's been in now for, wow, Amazing. Oh, it does. It's been in for about 20 minutes. So this is cauliflower. Um, if you don't have a little digital thermometer, I heartily, heartily recommend it because it's just the easiest way to be able to tell if these are really good to go. We're going to try to bring them up to a temperature. We're going to then allow them to rest, and in that rest, there'll be some carryover cooking. So we're looking for these to get up to about 145 and they're just right oh my gosh that cauliflower smells so good i know i know these <laughs> the are porcini pepper these are holding right around 130 so we don't have long to go on those at all all right so while they're still cooking 
Let's get into these. Oh, oh wow. Mm, they're browning so beautifully. Mm -hmm. So nice. I'm going to pull right over here. Grab yeah. this. Okay, so you're just kind of mixing them up a little right. bit. Right. I'm going to kind of see. We're already starting to get a little bit of separation with them. Remember, the oven is super hot. So working really, really nicely. Our green beans are really having some fun. They're letting you know, I know. I think they kind of wanted that lid off too. They were doing their thing. And they're like, don't just talk about broccoli. I know, so I'm gonna go ahead and take advantage of this moment, move this up to the higher level now because these have done a really good cooking. Gonna get that kind of close. And um, let's talk about what's gonna happen next because as soon as we're ready, while the cauliflower is still in the pan, we're gonna add this beautiful cheese mixture, almost in little glops. Again, we're not tossing it. This is not like a cheesy sauce, like a macaroni and cheese. Instead, this is little glops um, right on top of the cauliflower. Then we're gonna to be topping it with our cheese breadcrumb blend. And that's what we're gonna let kind of toast for us right in the whole of it. So maybe this is a good time while it's all starting to come together that we should talk about our next class. Oh, I love that. So we have officially started spring, like we said at the beginning, and we love these flavors. That the ones that we're doing, the chili lime, the um, adobo kitchen, and the porcini pepper are m some of my personal favorites. And so we wanted to put them all together so that we could enjoy them in the meals. So next month, it's going to be on May 23rd. We're going to keep these Thursdays through the spring. So we hope it's great for you. Um, but we're going to be doing a chili lime meal. We're going to be doing pork chops. And do you want to tell about the delicious sides? Yeah. Well, it's pork chops with chili lime. Yes. Uh, we haven't done pork chops somehow in this I know. We couldn't time. believe it. Yes, exactly. Um, but we're going to be doing them, um, searing them and doing kind of a little pan roasting. And then we're going to be able to see, um, let's see, what do you call them? Crash potatoes? Crash potatoes. potatoes. So okay. another Pam Smith kitchen hack um, on making some delicious potatoes called crashed potatoes. And those will be with the porcini pepper as well. And it's and gonna be amazing. It really is gonna be amazing. The, the, the crushed potatoes are super fun. If you've not done them before, they have been kind of a rage on Pinterest, but um, I just love them. I've done them for with a few of my restaurants that I've worked with. They're amazing to have as a breakfast side. They're delicious to have it at a meal as we're gonna be having, and um, I think could be really, really fun. Oh, so, okay, so you're going through now. The glaze mm -hmm. has really um, kind of cooked, cooked on it. it yeah. has. And so you're going back and adding more, just another dollop on top. Mm -hmm. Just to give it a little special extra flavor and moisture. And then that's going to have a little bit of a different layering of texture. And these are really pretty much done. We'll pop them right back in for just one more minute while right. that cauliflower is doing its magic. Now, once that cauliflower is on the top, do you try to pay very close attention to it to make sure or Not at yet. what point? Okay. Where we really start paying attention to it is when we get the cheese and the breadcrumbs on it. Okay. Because that is when we put it on to broil. <clears throat> and that is also when the potential for burning is very real. So then those go right back in. We'll go ahead and pull this out. A lot going on here. There is, but I love how you're showing us how to cook several things in the oven at one time mm -hmm. and kind of where it needs to go on the racks and making it happen. I know it was really a lot of thought that went into this of how do we make this meal in about an hour? It's right. not it's not a meal that typically could be made no, in an hour. No. So we were thrilled to be able to put it together in a way that we could come and do this. Now what I've seen you do is pull all the cauliflower kind of together, almost right. in a little oval. Because remember I talked about the glopping. I wanna be able to glop this yogurt blend and cheese blend right on top of it. 
So it's going to get all yummy and delicious. There's cheeses there, both the Gruyere and the Parmesan. And it kind of just becomes one with the cauliflower. Mm. So good. It really oh my is. My gosh, is everybody just so excited to eat this? <laughs> I think some people are probably very hungry. They've moved on to their wine, so. <laughs> <laughs> cooking with wine, I think that could be the other name of our cooking class. Exactly, so you see these are not, it's not like pouring a sauce on, and that's by design, because you can actually see the cheese, the shredded cheese in here. Well, that's gonna melt when we get it back into the oven, and it's just gonna become kind of a creamy goodness all the way through. We're gonna pop this right back into the oven. Get that picked up. I'm gonna put it right back in and let that just kind of start to melt a bit. Right. And I love that we're learning a cauliflower um, side because mm -hmm. cauliflower is such a a thing that people are going to right now, but it's how to make it delicious. It mm -hmm. shouldn't be a punishment right. to eat cauliflower. Mm -hmm. This is just such a delicious, craveable way to do it. So these come out, they should be just at the right, perfect temperature. Always good to check. Again, we talked about carryover cooking. Um, really important because these are small, and so right now, these are at one 55. Okay. So that means in the next five minutes or so, we're going to see those go up to about 160, even 165, which is what we want to do. Okay. So pulling them out around 150, mm -hmm. 155, is that what? Yeah, 150 is 150. always good because they mm -hmm. just go away really, really yeah. quickly. Um, we, um, again, very forgiving though. If you end up overcooking them, it's another one of the benefits of the mushroom blend because there's so much moisture in them, even overcooked, even reheated, you don't end up getting this dry kind of product. Instead, you just get all of that moisture and all of that great flavor. Amazing. So we're gonna let those just rest right in the pan itself. Okay. Let's um, give a little test to our green beans. And they Oh, you're cooking. right, they kept all that green. Amazing, right? Yes, yeah, so different than opening the pot and seeing brown green beans in mm -hmm. front of you. Yeah, so these are good. Gonna get those turned off. And those have been in just long enough that we're gonna go back in. Oh, so you're already oh, starting yeah. to see it go. At this point, I'm going to, sorry, I'm getting mm -hmm. right in your way, but I'm gonna pause this and I'm gonna switch it to broil. If it will allow me. <laughs> That's right, stop. Broil. Hmm. Wonder why it doesn't want me to do that. Oh, it's not fun at all, is it? There okay, we go. now, it just wanted me to cooperate with its way. And remember that little blend that I did with the breadcrumbs and the remaining Parmesan? And I just sprinkle that right on top of this. If someone's trying to avoid um, gluten and not wanting to do breadcrumbs, no problem with that at all. You could certainly do a gluten-free breadcrumb or just add some extra cheese okay. and leave the bread out all together. When in doubt, add extra cheese. It's kind of a, a goal. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna let that go. This is where you said, do you need to be careful? Yeah. The answer is yes. Okay, so we're now broiling and broiling yes. is no joke. Broiling is no joke. And how long do you wanna leave them to broil? Um, probably just about three, maybe five minutes at the top. Okay. So while that's happening, I can go ahead and work to get this plated, and then we'll just add the cauliflower so that we can make the magic happen. Now, even though we have some of the beautiful tomato glaze on top, I'm going to add just a little bit to the plate itself because you know how I love to do my little swooshes, right? And it's been so long. So I've done a swoosh. Those of you watching who remember last year's classes, the swoosh, it was our go-to, but 
It's been a while since we've had the Pam Smith signature swoosh. swoosh. So to do that swoosh, you just get your little tomato sauce in a nice little well, and then take your spoon and just swoosh it right through. And then take your beautiful little meatloaves mm. and put right on top. They pop really beautifully right out. How about oh, that? That is beautiful. We already have our green beans all ready to go. So we're going to just get those right onto our dish as well. And the color contrast between the red glaze and the green, green beans, it's just beautiful. It just beckons you to eat well, it. Well, it's again, it's a blue plate special with a difference, yeah. right? Um, we have um, a little bit of your breadcrumbs here. If you wanted to sprinkle just a little bit of that right on top of it, a little cheese, a little of the breadcrumbs that we had on top of our cauliflower, you can certainly do that. No need to. Um, we have some beautiful cilantro, remember, that we used inside of it, so we can add that. And then we can make magic happen by adding our cheesy cauliflower, which should be just about at the danger zone right now. Now, for those of you who are cooking and listening and watching, we can't wait to hear about your meal. We hope that it has turned out very, very similar. We have a question about broiling. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, are you broiling on low? But I am looking over and seeing... We're broiling on high. We're broiling on high. We are. Okay, indeed. this is what our broiling on high gave us. Yes, beautiful brown cheesiness. Look at that. Wow. Mm. See all that lusciousness? Look at that yes. cheese. So good. So good. <laughs> so good. And there we oh, go. Delicious. Isn't it? And is this about how much you would serve to one person? Would you do two of the meatloaf muffins? Or how, how do you decide that? So we used, just to give a little idea, we used a, a pound and a half of... Of, of actual ground meat, which is, if we were doing math, 24 ounces. So if you make 12 little meatloaves, you're getting basically two ounces of the ground beef in each one, or ground turkey, or whatever you might be using. The rest is produce, it's mushrooms, and onions, and red pepper. So you're just getting four ounces of meat and yet it looks so plentiful, doesn't it? Yes. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a huge meal. Then you add to it the cheesy cauliflower, the green beans. It's what magic is all about. Again, comfort food at its finest. It really is. Kind of in so many no ways. guilt indulging. And yeah. I am going to get this one final picture of this beautiful meal. And then... Are we going to post ours? Are we going to uh, post... Post our picture? We... <laughs> Oh, wait. Here, let me put porcini powder There you go. Yes. yes. So let this be a reminder. If you would like, if you would like this knife, the gourmet prep knife, post your meal with your jar of porcini pepper, chili lime, or, or adobo, or a bag, whatever you may have on hand that you just used, and um, enter for your chance to win that knife. Really fun. And a big thank you to Cutco for making that such a fun contest yes, for us. Indeed. And a huge thank you to, to Chandra, our Spice Girl, for taking your questions and helping to understand all the little hacks that go with it. Um, we are back on May 23rd, as we May said, with our pork chop and our crashed potatoes. I know, it's going to be so good. And then we're doing a, a summer gazpacho in June that's going to be off the charts. So. Lots of delicious yet to come. We can't wait to have you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Send us your pictures so that we can celebrate you together. And thank you for being on our culinary journey. Yes, we love it and we love you. Thanks so much. Cheers and bon appetit.